My name is Gus and I'm a manager consultant at Source Technology and this is the first episode of my brand new podcast series, The Tech Lab. In this series, we bring you insightful discussions with some of the most talented leaders in tech. Our mission is simple, to provide value to you, our listener. We'll give you the opportunity to hear from these leaders in a more intimate setting where you can come together to discuss hot topics, market trends and key challenges facing the software engineering space. Ultimately, our goal is to offer you practical insights and tangible solutions that you can apply to your own business context. Whether you're a seasoned professional or just starting out in the field, we promise to deliver you content that everyone can learn from. Today, I'm joined by Nuno. Nuno is the ex-CTO at HelloFresh, where he worked for eight years developing their tech organization, building their digital products and leading their software teams. He then took that passion for leadership and innovation and founded a new venture called Slow Growth, where he spent the last two years acting as an interim CTO for his customers. He's recently decided to take a step away from freelancing and join a new company that we'll discuss shortly. We'll delve into Nuno's journey so far, his key achievements, and most importantly, the lessons and advice he has to share for those aspiring to succeed in the world of tech. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy today's episode. Welcome, Nuno. How are we doing this evening? Uh, great, great. Thank you for having me, Gus. Thank you. Very welcome to have you here. Uh, absolute pleasure. Uh, uh, it would be great if you could start by telling us a little bit about your journey into the tech industries, from sort of the moment where software first kind of captured your heart uh, to where we are, obviously, today um well that that brings me back um so i would say the the first time i remember coding um so i had i had a, a computer when i was a kid that was already there as long as i remember myself i guess uh, zx spectrum um which you could code in basic uh, i didn't do much coding but I, I remember that as a kid i figured out how to print um characters and and would draw castles with the characters with the 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 characters that it allowed to print and i i remember spending a lot of time doing that and then at some point later on some years later with uh, with windows uh, windows had some what was it? What was it called? Uh, the, there was a basic version of Windows, a, a basic as in the programming language basic, Q basic or smart basic or something like that. And they had a few games in it and the game came with a code base. And I remember tinkering with that as well. Um, but it was only when I went to college that I actually uh, went to computer science and then I started learning how to code. Um, but then I, I dropped out of it. You obviously went on to do computer science at, uh, it was at university. You say you dropped out. What was uh, what was the sort of reasoning and thought behind that? Yeah, so um, I did drop out because so I went into IT, I guess what you could call IT engineering. So it was a very conservative course in a conservative university that was mostly based on that had a lot of physics and algebra and calculus in the first and second year. So it was a common start for all of the engineerings um and it was so it was more like computer engineering maybe um and it was really academic and I've, i i wasn't really in my element so it was it was not an environment where i was that was optimized for me learning it was a party city i was living alone for the first time but not just that the, the rooms were huge with a lot like hundreds of people uh, attending like a calculus one and calculus two um classes and so i honestly i i felt dumb for the first time in my life that i really couldn't grasp those those concepts and so i really felt frustrated use of my time and i, I dropped out of it and then i went and did something uh, i went to a new course that had uh, just started in in the university of my hometown which was where i went back to and there this was really new it had been put together and it was very cross-functional it had as it had programming but for websites and actually at the at the time also interactive cd roms and stuff like that but it also had a lot of sociology and communication theory anthropology and i actually learned also how to 
how to manage a balance sheet on that course. So it was a very, it was very, it, it taught you a little bit of everything and not a lot of anything. So nowadays I have a lot of colleagues that are in all kinds of, of businesses. They're cameramen working in multimedia or advertising or journalists. Um, and a lot, and some of them designers, programmers, and a lot of stuff related to IT. So th that was that was a great decision to drop out of computer science in that context. Yeah, interesting. I, I mean, I myself can't really relate because I've never had like a mathematical or scientific brain. And <laughs> when numbers when numbers come into my brain, it starts to melt. <laughs> um, <laughs> how did you? So coming from that sort of where you're picking up these sort of business skills, how did you then gravitate towards your like first job in tech then? Yeah. Um, so, so that course have was very practical. So we were doing projects all the time, um, and they would put these these things, some of these disciplines together, and make us do projects on on several disciplines at once. So that was interesting. And then, at the end, it had also an internship. And in that internship, I had so this was in Portugal. Uh, I I did a um, what do you call it an in, an interchange uh, an exchange. Mm. With an exchange student uh, to Salamanca in Spain and there I both finished I think the last semester but then made some friends and found a company there to do an internship so the first internship that I had I was a Java developer a junior Java developer or an apprentice Java developer we would receive our tickets would come printed in A4 um, uh, documents so and, and stapled together so it wasn't a gyro ticket it would be something you printed out and I feel really old about that now that I'm, <laughs> that I'm saying this and we had a source safe um, version control system so I had to code my ticket which was huge um, really several pages of ticket on top of code that already existed that came from the architects which was which were somewhere else in a different uh, city I guess and um, they and then we used a, 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 a version control system that every once in a while would try and merge all of the work together and it was a nightmare but I, I learned a lot doing that so that was my first my first real job nice. so from then on I did a lot of different things so I was an engineer for a long time both wor worked in a few other companies but then with some friends set up a software a software development agency and that's where that was my real experience around building software for somebody where it was we were th three people um, and grew up to to 10. Um, it was a, a software agency and there we were doing everything from sales the hr admin and coding all the time pretty much all the time for for clients that were very specific it was like we built custom-made solutions at that point I was working in PHP and uh, and did a lot of PHP and and flash and action script uh, apps there so this was around I, I believe seven years that I did this and and that really taught me a lot um, and then at some point it was it was it had been seven really intense years of working and then I decided to go back to my hometown study a little bit more back to that university that had taught me so much and then and then by luck I started working in a in a software agency in Portugal um I wanted to move near my girlfriend which was in Porto and uh, she actually mentioned that there was a company hiring there rocket internet had just opened a tech hub and there were sourcing engineers and that felt like a good opportunity to work close to home uh, but actually the second day of working I was flying to Berlin because Rocket Internet HQ is is in Berlin to get some some training which never happened we just started started working right away and was quite super interesting what we built then um, but basically then that's how I very quickly also fell in love with Berlin and then a few weeks later stayed here I guess for five weeks got back to Portugal, spoke with my girlfriend, got married, so now my wife, um, and then I moved, so then I started going back and forth to Berlin, but we eventually uh, decided to move here, yeah. Uh, and then here, worked for a while in at Pay11, which was the company, the company then was acquired by SumUp, um, and it's now SumUp, and then uh, e even before that, that happened, um, they had transitioned so I was managing a PHP backend 
and they were transitioning into a Java backend. And my boss at the time, um, which which did, did a great thing, which was introduced me to to the founders of HelloFresh, who were looking for a CTO at the time. And and HelloFresh was really um, uh, in its young days; it was one year old. And by coincidence, actually, my colleagues at Rocket Internet had also the ones that were working on the table next to me were had happened to be to be working on it. So I was a little bit familiar with the project, and that actually triggered a lot of things. Interesting. Uh, and then. What what made you sort of take that dive into developing a company, the, your company Slow Growth, and what sort of what was that transition like? Yeah, so so well after after HelloFresh, then after I started HelloFresh, I then spent eight years there. Right, it was a it was a huge journey, and and it's uh, you know very very dear to my heart. Um, and uh, but of course it did pay a toll on uh, on me. So at some point I wanted to to also spend some time um, uh, with time for me, for my family, and to figure out like and and to also just let the, all of the learnings of eight years of hyper growth settle in. And that was how slow growth kind of kind of happened. Um, so basically. I wanted to not work, right? I, I made a commitment, not just to me, also to my family that I didn't want to work. But it happens there also that when I don't work, <laughs> I get bored and I'm not, I'm also not that pleasant if I'm too bored. Um, <laughs> and I don't know what to do and I'm bored. So eventually, I guess I did start doing a lot of things that I couldn't, that I didn't have the chance to do before. For example, I started swimming and now I actually swim regularly and I hope that I'll be able to keep that. Um, and there were a lot of other things that I got to do that I, that I hadn't, that I didn't have the time before, but at some point, you know, you start wanting to, wanting to work. And of course I was lucky to have some, some invites of people that wanted to, to me to support them either on their company or just give their advice, etc. So I started doing different things. I, 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 we set up slow growth, me and my wife, and I started using it to do different things, whatever would come, some opportunities that I wanted to grab. So that became doing uh, mentorship and 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 coaching gigs. Um, met a lot of a lot of great people like that. Um, did uh, tech due diligence assessments for for some some venture capital companies um, funds. So that was also cool. It, it allowed allowed me to see other companies working, how other CTOs had managed their companies uh and how creative they had been and uh, also how inspiring got a got a lot of new new ideas things that never yeah. occurred to me in certain ways of implementing certain things so so that was a great experience did a, a cto master class with with colib which was um really cool to meet also other uh other technical leaders from from great companies um and teach them but also learn a lot by their own experiences right mm. so, it's more like sharing knowledge and learning, um, and that was a great experience. And then got to be also interim CTO, and particularly with the Mother Milkman, which was a, a, a client that's also close to my, to my heart, and uh, spent spent a good time with them. Um, also building, which have a, a great idea that touches a little bit on on the on the grocery space and 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 eating healthy, but also in the sustainability. Um, space which also is interesting to me now in the, those eight years at hello fresh obviously i imagine you come under a, a number of business circumstances and challenges and in that two years as well you know with the things like the coli uh, master class um, and just helping out you know a, an array of different organizations at different sizes and you know venture capitalists and things what are those what sort of values can you take from those 10 years in total and and, and bring to the table for, for your new role, do you think? Um, hmm. it sounds a bit like an interview question. <laughs> um, yeah, good question. Um, so I think there's definitely a, 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 an, a the, what the experience brings it, it is that it, it helps you have a frame of reference with a comparison point. I guess the hardest maybe one of the hardest things I would say across, across my time at HelloFresh is that I had no reference point to understand if 
what was being done and what we were able to accomplish, if that was good, bad, how good, how bad. And so at some point, while while in HelloFresh, I had the opportunity to meet other leaders that had gone through the same thing and then found somewhat of a reference point. So, But today, taking on a new opportunity, of course, you have a lot more of that. So um, there's definitely, I would say that there's a lot more of the things that you know you don't want to do it like that, rather than the things that you're sure on how you want to do it. Mm. I think there's still a lot of room to the fact that just organizations are very different from each other, even sometimes competitors working on the same space, like the culture, the way that people, how, what resonates with people, what they're worried about, what's the current, what's the mood of the day, the values, etc. So the actual implementation of a lot of these concepts around high performance in, in, in technology organizations have to do with our implementation details. Like, like you know, if you want a good, it, it ha- it really depends on how you implement things, like a, like a program, like like an application. You can try and implement in a, it. It can, in the end, be an efficient product or or be something that that is a little bit clunky. So I guess it is hard to find out exactly how to do things and to give one recipe, one size fits all recipe for all of these organizational problems that we find ourselves thinking about. So, but what is easy to to know is what you don't want to do because you've done it in the past and you know that that absolutely doesn't work and you can read the current organization and understand maybe there are enough circumstances there that also will mean that that w- won't work there and that you know the more you do this the more you fail and then that's the experience that you bring with you a lot more than than the wins and i think this is this is really an important point because i think that it, it is the the original sentiment of startups of it is that being unafraid to fail and being and like le- dealing with with failure very you know head on and i think that as time goes by i i'm not sure that we are all able to keep that up as the companies grow but also as the as startups are not a new thing anymore now you can you can start a startup and actually from day one be quite afraid to fail and and not be around the culture where, where that's okay so i think that it's important that people realize that you do have to value the your learnings your learnings are always the things that didn't work because that's what you have then demonstrated what have worked what has worked yes maybe it was all of the great things that you did but ultimately then imposter syndrome kicks in and but maybe it was also luck right so maybe you got lucky right i guess yeah. that it builds perfectly into into our sort of the core of our discussion here where you know you, you've worked at these scale-ups you've worked at you know, hello fresh like you said from its sort of inception when it was a year old uh, and now you you are moving into a larger sort of enterprise customer um how do you approach building a high performing tech team in a startup versus a large enterprise yeah. so i i think that there are some common principles um i think everyone needs independently of the size you need to be able to give people the information that they need and the context that they need to work on the right things. Um, you can't really nowadays, and with the complexity of organizations that that build technology, you can't really prescribe what everyone should be doing all the time. Waterfall has proven to have its limits because you can't, if you want to really get to at scale, you need to allow, uh, autonomy is not something that teams uh, need to be happy. It's actually something that the companies themselves need to be able to scale and not have a top-down approach. Um, it is it is necessary for the company companies and for top management, at least management that understands how to deliver high-performing organizations. It is necessary that you allow for everyone to have in all, the information that they need in all of the context that they need to make the right decisions and build the right things. And for that, basically, the job becomes. To be to be a communicator and to be able sometimes to articulate things that are very that are hard to define or for example be able to give people the tools to make the right decisions in a in a situation where you can't do a flow chart or a decision tree so you need to so because when when the decision when the answer is always it depends which is what happens in our field here the answer is always it depends and what matters is what you say next so and what you decide next 
So you need to provide teams with an understanding of what's going on. And basically you need to try for everyone to make the same decision as the CEO would mm -hmm. in that in that position with that same amount of information. Ideally, that's what you're doing, of course, in a, in a clunky way. And it's not about creating clothes of the CEO, but you know, you know what I'm saying, that, that they would leave have enough context that they can make the perfect decision in that context. And that's hard and it becomes a job of being a communicator, creating frameworks for alignment, which is a very, uh, you know, cumbersome way of basically having people and have the same understanding of the business reality, the customer reality, where are we going? Why are we going there? Why do we think that that's the most important thing to do this quarter? Um, those kinds of things. So, so that you can do at any scale, and that's the problem at any scale. But that's easy to do in a team of with a team of five or seven, working co-located like we used to be, not anymore. That's easy. You get up in the room and you say, "So, everyone, here's the deal. Somebody just said this, or a customer said this. What are we going to do about it? You can have a conversation around it. When it's two hundred people, you need to have other mechanisms to do that, and that's why you know reporting lines exist and operating models exist and teams and we put people together and and then that's where you know we struggle as managers to figure out what's the right way to do this because it's really hard it's it's really you know hard and it's very hard to measure as well mm. uh, you can try and measure it of course but it's yeah. so hard and and this you know having this ability to steer and sort of give structure while also giving them autonomy um is this is it easy to to scale autonomy like how how would this approach work so i was when i was younger i also shared an, a, a point of view that i still see today especially you know in, in the young in the younger people which is that when working inside the tech team doing tickets etc there is you know you think that the, the st stakeholders are not really don't really know what they're asking you or that they don't have they don't understand the system right and they don't understand the problem that you're facing and so so that you should have a lot more autonomy and I, and and I stand by that I think that there's a lot of truth to that but I've also learned <clears throat> and you know it's in <clears throat> it's important to remain hum humble when you're when you're learning how to code because it, if you do it long enough, it, just, it constantly comes back and, and teaches you a lesson. So <clears throat> you need at some point you learn that actually <clears throat> um, stakeholders also have a very different perspective of, of the business and they also have a very different perspective of of what's going on there. So. So the way that I see autonomy today is that it's one axis of, of two things. It's autonomy and alignment, and that's not just something that I see. It's it's something that is you know a lot of people have have stated that, and I think that they're right. It's it's about it's getting the team to be highly autonomous but highly aligned, which means that if they're highly aligned, they're actually not super autonomous because what you're looking for is a team that is willing to converge into the other teams and that is able to work together with other teams. So it's also a team that accepts to have its own autonomy constrained by the needs of the bigger group. So it's the semi-autonomy autonomous state that you that you kind of need to create. And um, and I think that it's very hard to ask that of a team just by itself to happen. You can't go and ask a team, please, you know, pay attention to the presentation and then make the right decisions and then, you know, do it like that. Um, it's actually, you know, a, an environment that you have to create. So uh, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it, it's, it's hard to put together. Mm. And um, out of out of interest, when you were a globe, was there a difference when you were a global CTO sort of level at like Harry Fresh? Was there a difference between that? And then when you did advisory work for them afterwards, did you have a different view in terms of like stakeholder management and this sort of like autonomy and autonomy structure? There's a world of difference. Like it's not even the same. It's not even, it's not the same job. It's not even the same. It's not the same sport. No, I think one thing, and there's a name for that. So I, I think it's Solomon syndrome. I think it is. Other people's problems are, are easy to analyze and get to, 
get to a solution quick, quickly. You always have an opinion on other people's problems and you, yeah, if I were him, I would do this, if I were she. Um, so that's easy. So when you're doing advisory, it's a lot more like that. Oh, in this, that situation, you should do this, that, the other, in a way that I, I, I never had, I've never been so certain of that on the things that I'm doing, right? But, and it's not that, you know, I don't care about that that outcome. It's just that it's it's much easier to reason about it because you only have a much smaller chunk of information. So you it, it also and and you're drawing it more from experience. You're kind of filling in the blanks. It becomes easier. So that's that's one point that was clear to me. Um, and the other one is that also even when working more as a consultant involved with the teams, even as interim CTO, um, it's it's not the same thing. It's not like you're everyone. The context is that you are there temporarily. And the context is that um, you, you're not the long term visionary that you're going to uh, that you that people expect need uh, in, in most cases. So um, what then happens is that um, it's more about influencing. It's more about, about convincing um, and then and it's not uh, as much about being an executive, which is where which comes with some some authority in itself, let's say, mm -hmm. and even you know the way people work with you, it's a, it's different. So what that has brought, however, is a lot more value because as time went by and even as HelloFresh grew, there was a level of proximity and of openness that I could get from people that you know it started becoming harder for me to get to. So you know, for people will pay, uh, have some respect, maybe some undeserved respect for my position, and they will act, maybe treat me with some deference, not really tell me the whole truth or not really venting to me, et cetera. And that's something that being uh, an interim CTO or a consultant or et cetera, you can get more to the core of. Uh, that's something that happens a little bit more. So so that was interesting as well. And 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 that was that was also taught me a lot on maybe how I can create that environment uh, also when 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 I am when I'm working full time. Um, but yeah, so so I'd say those two things were very, very apparent that they're very different. Nice, that's really interesting. Um, just just on a side note as well, is there any <clears throat> when you're installing these like metrics or these frame the frameworks for like alignments and things? Um, do you ever do they ever become like a feel like a burden for your development team or do you think they're being misinterpreted at all? OK, so let's let's uh, uh, put a little bit of, of um, meat into that. What is a framework for alignment? And, and so th there are many tools that you can use. So one that we you and I have discussed at length is uh, Dora metrics, which track development frequency in a team and error rates. And they're extremely, let's say they're good in the, the the case for the Dora metrics is that they're good indicators of high performance and that they allow you to uh, very subjectively and with with a lot of degree for error but they, they allow you to get some insights especially if you're working in a team if you look at your Dora metrics it kind of allows you to get insights as to where should i be spending my time becoming more efficient as a team so it is it is something that it's a tool like many others that teams and organizations can use to have some re frame of reference, going back to one of the earlier questions of how good am I as a team really? Because, um, you know, this feels good or we're rocking it today or the adrenaline is high are not necessarily good indicators. So so that's one of that needs to be used in conjunction with a lot of different things. And then so it depends on the organization again and it depends on the implementation, but of course, product metrics a north star or and it starts with you know it starts with the balance sheet it starts with what are the financial outcomes that we need out of this fiscal year as well which is something that a lot of a lot of in you know we don't usually we don't talk about it that much and that actually now with an economical downturn suddenly becomes a little bit more apparent to to engineering teams out there that over the last 10 years may may haven't worried too much about for instance meeting the budget or um or, or those types of things so um it's important to have all of the so from budget to uh, product metrics business metrics then performance metrics of your systems incident metrics do you have incidents how often can you fix them on time can you spot them early um how many bugs do you have open 
terrible metric. But if you can track how many bugs do you have, a terrible metric in in isolation, but how many bugs do you have open? How long have they been open? Uh, why don't you at least decide to not fix them and mark them as won't fix? Like there's a lot of things that you can do to track, not to make a judgment in itself, but maybe to understand where to spend your time as a manager, as a leader. Because there's a lot of things that happen. So as as a leader, you need that to know where to focus your attention, what is red, what is not working in a material way that can that I should focus my time on. As a team, you also need that so that you can check on other people. It's like going in a it's like looking at 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 the other person's accelerometer and see are we going at the same speed if you have to go at the same speed. If you're trying to to fly uh, or to do synchronized swimming, you kind of need to check on other people. So if you're all influencing one metric, if you're all influencing or if you all have to go in one direction, it kind of becomes easy for you to know when do we actually need to sit and have a meeting because, you know, what we thought were was going in the right direction is now going in the, in the wrong direction. So you need this for everyone to know. And objectively, am, did, are we doing a good job here or are we not? Because you, what you cannot do is rely on gut feeling, rely on the loudest stakeholder. The You need to come, this is software engineering. If it is software engineering or if we're doing any kind of engineering, it has to have a sci some scientific method to it, right? And you need to be able to come to the same conclusion, sometimes not even being the same room, but having the same context and, and looking at the same metrics that team A and team B are likely going to take it a direction are going likely going to then change their direction to in the same uh, pointing the same way so so all of these metrics are important to have for people to feel to also if completely different topic if we think about psychological safety that is about understanding why am i here why are we doing this am i how can I use my time best? And can I be comfortable that today I did a good job, delivered value to the customer, delivered value to the user and to the company? So that's why we need them. There's many of them. Um, Dora has been, I think, it's good enough to fill a vacuum that is there about software engineering performance um, that is very, that is technical, maybe, maybe not to explain here, uh, but uh, you need to use them in conjunction and knowing that if you if you focus too much on one you're going to start you're going to start making the wrong decisions um, and if collectively we only optimize for the one thing is that you know revenue or customer growth or, and you miss out on everything else it's like you're flying a plane there's a lot of lights blinking you need to react to a lot of things to keep course and you need a lot of people to do that at the same time. So that's so th these alignment frameworks are basically the lights blinking. If you've been doing a lot lo this long enough, if you have been paying attention to your failures and learning from them, if you've kept yourself humble over time, you're probably going to reach the same conclusions as a, that will point into this in this direction. And because basically what what happened with me at HelloFresh is that. I I think one of the first things that I did when I left HelloFresh was finally sit down and read the Accelerate book. I had mm -hmm. gone through it, I had learned the concepts, but mostly via just reading excerpts or um, uh, or, or via you know third parties, people telling me about it. Um, so I finally sat down and read it, and then I sat down and read Modern Software Engineering and and. Uh, from the Farley and basically I said, aha, yes, of course, yes, of course. And they were coming from a very different point of view, very different trajectory, uh, but basically with the same critical eye on on things and with a focus on actually delivering software that that delivering products that matter, no matter what, and, and just letting themselves be judged by outcomes, by what do the customers say and what is their feedback or very objective. So yeah, so that's that's how I think. So that's 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 the value of it, and because ultimately you you will reach those conclusions, or you see many other peers getting there. But it takes time, and and it may not be apparent, and a lot of these things may be counterintuitive when you first meet them. Mm, that makes sense. Thank you very much. Um, in terms of like the next section, I wanted to touch on because I know that you have 
you know, a lot of thoughts around sort of hiring when it comes to structuring tech teams as well. What are some of the common challenges that organizations face, Nuno, you know, when implementing best practices for hiring and structuring a tech team? They don't make hiring their first priority and their top priority all the time. And that's, uh, I, I assume you'll appreciate that one. <laughs> But that's the number one mistake, I would say, and the thing that if you if, that I've seen more often because and I understand why it happens because it's not when you need to hire also you you are usually in a situation that you have many many other things you need to do. And the immediate need um, is to do those things and not to go through CVs necessarily because hiring solves you the problem. On the midterm, uh, usually if you're working in tech and if you're working in Europe, it's more on the midterm. You probably have to wait like three months until you have somebody on board, if not a lot more. Um, so it then it is easy. Again, it's counterintuitive. It is easy that that's not the priority. But actually, if you are not if you are not extremely fast, if you don't use your top talent to do the hiring as a CTO, if you're not involved personally as much as you can. Um, to make sure that everyone has the right sense of urgency, even to, you know, really, even when we were really hiring a lot of people and companies were hiring a lot of people across the board, uh, you have to at least make time once in a while to meet somebody on the executive stage to check if, okay, are we still bringing in the right talent, at least to sample check. Um, that culture fit is there, the, the the level, the ambition level is there on the talent that you want to bring. And you need to create an environment again for people to to strive for bringing in people that are better than them. It's not easy if you have, you know, a boss that that uh, um, is a little bit scary. Maybe you don't maybe you want to protect yourself. Self-defense kicks in. You want to it's easy or it's easy that you may want to hire somebody that you can mentor, you know, that you can be a senior from. It's 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 but that's actually all come. It's counterintuitive what you should be doing. What you should be doing is hiring is a top priority because if you have a job open, the most important thing is to close it because that means that you need to increase the team to do something that you can't do right now. So you need to make time for it. Um, and then, and then, yeah, uh, as a leader and you be, be mindful if you, whenever you start delegating it, be mindful, be mindful that you are delegating the keys to the house, right? Who comes in, who joins the team, who gets to stay here? And and it's important, and it's a, a, an investment of time, of effort, of everyone's time. It is the, probably one of the most important things that you're doing, if not the, apart from keeping your systems alive. So in the teams that i've worked with i've always said unless the website is down or the app is down um the top priority is hiring right yeah unless the organization is on fire let's hire <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's interesting what you say in terms of like having that sign off having the, like holding the keys for example um so i do like the hiring funnel to be in a specific order, uh, not too detailed. I think there's room for adjustment there and I do adjust it as I implement it. But um, for example, the way that you structure a hiring funnel and then the way that you operate it, meaning how you source candidates and who sources the candidates, who should be involved, at what step of the way, how fast the process should run, how you should track it. That's something that it's not it's not a formula and it's not like the key five things to hire, but but it's something that, you know, I've done it so much and spent so much time doing it that I kind of have have a, have a way that I like doing it, that I feel after everything that I've gone through, that's the most efficient way of doing this, of doing this. Um, but the, so I guess that that could be like also a design pattern, I would say that hiring funnel. Um, but then it's also about a lot of this is when it comes to hiring a lot of it is also um you have to do it a lot it is just for example it is very hard to write a scorecard if you've never done that and even if you're if you're on your 10th or on your 20th it's also a rhyme it's very hard to write a scorecard um because it's hard to articulate how you find somebody how, how what you think about somebody 
and you won't, you were only with them an, an hour. How do you know if they're a good coder, if they're a good person, if they're going to be cool with the team, if they're a good fit? It's very hard. So it takes a really long time to do that. So also there, you, it's again, that is definitely not a formula, but it's something that I would spend time with the team that is hiring with me and with everyone involved, making sure that the pitch is right. Not that they say it the same ways, but that they understand that, okay, make sure that you talk about the things you like about our company. Why do you work here? And make sure that, and you know, make sure you talk about the technologies so you can talk with people and train the people that are involved in hiring to make it a, a more a more pleasant experience for the candidate, to make it attractive to, to the best candidates, to make it very unattractive to bad candidates, where you are by design trying to put to actually exclude some people that wouldn't be encouraged to do things to go through the funnel in, in a certain way and and that's and that's again something that you have to adapt to the market to the company etc but uh, but yeah an important part is the pitch also getting a, a good pitch and getting the customer the, the the candidate excited about applying to the company that's that's an art in itself that i wouldn't say that that i i have some experience with it of course but it's it's almost like advertising. Mm. Yeah, and, and let's say you have this. Let's say you, you're prioritizing hiring in, in your company. And you have that strong sense of urgency and motivation behind hires. Just from a personal perspective as well, this is super interesting in terms of sales. Is there? Is what would be the biggest bottlenecks if you already have all those things driving? behind like in terms of making hiring successful having that sense of urgency what are the biggest bottlenecks that can come into the hiring process do you think from an engineering standpoint <laughs> i mean i think you know what the bottleneck is because there's so many agencies trying to get that right which is the technical assessment because yeah. everyone wants to tell de to delegate it to a third party but actually to do it right you unless you don't have people that are qualified to do it sometimes you find yourself having to find talent on a new programming language or at a level or on a new skill a new skill you know sometimes you have to have your hire your first security engineer and you don't have a more senior security engineer to interview him something like that if that you want the best engineer out there to join your team so that you have the best team etc and it's hard it's really hard to assess that and the and to delegate that in the way that it's offered commercially, usually, it means to delegate that to people that are not necessarily more savvy than you doing it, usually less savvy than your engineering team, not more savvy. And it's about automating the process. But when you automate the process, you miss the person because uh, as it says on modern software engineering, um, software de development is a socio-technical activity. It is not just the technology, it's also about how you communicate as a team. How do you describe problems? Can you even describe problems well? Can you explain problems to other people? Can you work with others to accomplish something? It's a lot of as much about that, if as much about that as it is about technical skill. And it is how how and also it is about having those skills while being while working on a technical problem. So it it is very hard to assess. And it is very, it is even harder to delegate and to reproduce a formula that is going to deliver great outcomes all the time. It is, I would, I would, I believe it is impossible to do that. Um, so, but you can compromise, right? You can compromise. Maybe there are certain financial uh, situations, some certain economics or whatever that it makes sense that you do that. Um, but I'm, I'm still, I'm all, uh, I will be an eternal skeptical on that one. On you, you obviously mentioned technical tests there as well. What's your priority? Is it? I mean, what what do you favor almost? Is it is it the, uh, like a homework task, or do you prefer live coding? Do you prefer you know just a technical discussion, or do you have a do you have a preference at all, or does this completely change? As a hiring manager, I'm I'm agnostic. Uh, I prefer to provide op options, so, uh, a certain number of options, not a lot of options, because there needs to be some equity to the process. Candidates need to be more or less judged alike. But, you know, if I would get my, my 
choice all the time because this is also has to do with how many people can actually do this and how much time do we have to do this. But I would happily either do a technical assessment like a sync assessment, a live coding exercise, um, um, uh, you know, share some code that you've written in the past, uh, multiple answer questions, maybe as an initial assessment, but then would need to have a thorough technical interview, for example, with like a long one, um, which means that you're spending also a lot of your top talents time doing these. So they come, we need to, you need to assess the cost because you need, if you need to hire at scale as well, then you need to start doing the math of, do I have enough engineering time to even to go through these tests, right? But um, so you need to strike the right balance and maybe give some options to candidates so that people can also, so that they can also, but you don't, you know, sometimes people don't like one thing and then they drop out of the out of the funnel. So you need to give them options as well. Uh, so, yeah, so that's my preference. As a candidate, though, uh, my preference would probably be live coding test. Although I don't think that I ever did one. <laughs> <laughs> that might be why it's your preference. <laughs> Maybe. Um, when you were speaking about hiring, you obviously mentioned that like ultra fast processes, and it's obviously a common trait in the, in the tech industry. How do you keep up with this sort of fast paced changes in technology and adapt it to the hiring process? Hmm. Good question. So one thing that I encourage my teams to do is to do pair review of candidates. Uh, or pair sourcing. That means that once in a while, you don't need to do it that often, but once in a while, if you have your recruiters, which are usually going through LinkedIn, GitHub, et cetera, sourcing candidates, once in a while, I would ask a, a good engineer to sit and, or or the hiring manager actually uh, to sit and and do that that exercise with, with the recruiter. Uh, so pairing on it. And as they do that, and I do that all the time, especially if it's a new a new role, um, where basically spend an hour going through LinkedIn and say, okay, I'm going through this profile. I like this profile because I see this, I see that, I see the other. I see these signs, these are the things that I'm looking at, and they lead me to believe that this is a good person to try out, and they, and this is another person that maybe, maybe it's a no. This one maybe, we'll see later. So, and do that exercise so that you calibrate um, the expectations. And the thing is that your needs of talent usually tend to change a lot faster than your job descriptions that you have written down. Uh, as you hire, you're going to have people that come in with new skills. You used to have no DevOps capacity. Now there's you have three DevOps because that turns out two backend engineers can also do DevOps. Right. So now maybe if you're still looking, you, you're now want to sit with the engineer again and say, oh, no, actually, you already have that. But maybe you can you can be doing this. Adjustment because it's not a new, a new job, it's maybe an adjustment. You can do that by once in a while pairing with a recruiter and, you know, with this exercise, then it's clear that we're kind of fine tuning a little bit. If it's if everything has to be a new job, then it's very hard to do that. Very cumbersome. And. Um... That's interesting what you're saying with sort of sitting down with the recruiter itself and defining these sort of almost, you're almost like the, the way you approach, approach software engineering and, and networking with engineers, you're you're showing them the guidance and then you're going right now, now get on with it. Is there any like, what if there's any sort of recruiters listening to this, what qualities did the best sort of people teams have that, you, that you've worked with? Um, there are, um, they they really care about people they they put in a lot of value a lot of effort into their work they are able to go through candidates in a very through a lot of candidates in a way that feels personable to a lot of them and ultimately they a good recruiter you can you can you can spot a, a good recruiter by you know also by the how how much the candidate knows about the company how excited he is um so you can spot if and and it's hard to do that if it's always different people, right? Um, with different interests. So you need to be able to cater the pitch that you have. That maybe I sat down with you and I gave you the pitch once or twice, but then you have to do that in a way that resonates with every single person that you talk with on a one-to-one -one basis. And that ideally leads people to actually apply and be motivated. Maybe they need to wait a weekend more for the answer or one week more. 
So they are able to always manage that relationship in a way where the candidate feels that at the end they were extremely well treated. So something and and actually the whole funnel, if you ever get and I have the pleasure of having at least once, but actually I know that it happens more, more at least twice uh, uh, that I know of at HelloFresh, which was for people that candidates that were rejected, ultimately referring other people because you know what? I didn't get the job, but the experience was so good and these guys seem to, you know, know what they're doing that I'm referring this other person that is actually more senior than me for this job. That then tells you that, okay, this is a great experience. We're doing something right because even somebody that didn't get the job actually feels that, well, <laughs> job well done, guys. So so the recruiter, going back to the recruiter, I think I think is having that quality of being able to deliver an experience that is catered to the candidate, right? And that also is able, you know, I, I definitely trust the gut feeling of a good recruiter if they say, you know what, this is there's a red flag here on this candidate. So they're also, you know, involved enough that they are part, they are an opinion that matters. They also have a scorecard, right? Mm -hmm. um, Maybe it's an implicit one, not necessarily written down. But if you're a good recruiter, I care about about what you saw in the candidate as well and what it was the experience like, because you probably spent more time with that candidate than anyone else in the team. And you saw a lot of things there that 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 will that you have an opinion on. We work in the same company, you know, the culture. So it's definitely an, uh, an asset. That's really interesting. And it goes back to those soft skills that are so important that you were mentioning before, whether it be you're a recruiter or you're an engineering leader. Um, yeah, that's super interesting. Out of interest, what's the hardest role do you think to hire for, like across like product, design, data, sort of? What do you think is the high, hardest role to hire for? That's a tough one. Like nowadays? Nowadays, yeah. I would say security. security, security, yeah. good security engineer. It seems like already from the stats that we're seeing from our from like our recruitment side, our cyber and our security divisions are doing extremely well and getting a lot of business. Is there is there a reason why it's so important at that at the moment? Don't know. <laughs> it, there's no talent <laughs> there. It's how do you become a security engineer? How do you know there's there's that I know there is in Italy that there must be a really good university on this. Uh, but all of the security engineers that I know tend to be Italian, but I know from other nationalities, a lot of them were also, you know, tinkerers. They and a lot of them were outcasts <laughs> of society, society outcasts, right? We don't produce that many that end up becoming also, you know, uh, high functioning security engineers. Um, it is it, I don't think it will ever be, you know, big business because it's going to be really hard to scale. And it is something that also SaaS has limitations on what it can provide. Because you cannot mimic somebody that has the budget and the motive to be out there to get you. You cannot mimic that behavior of somebody that really knows a lot about computers that it's either paid or is very invested in getting to you. So that can really, you know, unleash creativity in people and get them really motivated and, you know, and and then they're they're very dangerous. So you want to you want to prepare for that and and it's hard. There's it's it's a hard business. It's it's because I imagine that it's also not not easy to get to that level where you can be a uh, like, a, for instance, a, a penetration tester that is that is good. Um, and so so it's the talent is is we don't produce enough security engineers and the the environment is definitely prone that there will be more and more demand. So maybe it is also an opportunity for universities and, you know, academies out there to focus a little bit on this. But it's also not it has a high barrier of entry as well. It's not something you can learn. It's not JavaScript. It's not. It's not web development that you can learn in a bootcamp. It is. It takes years and and decades to be at the level of an attacker, right? So, say to me, it's extremely glamorous. I find it. I find conversations with security engineers. I just I geek out. I love it. I you know I don't understand half of it. It is really. It's just that it's very low level, right? It's in the sense of low level in terms of engineering, and it's very, 
um, the way of thinking is also very creative and it's about breaking things. It's about using systems the way that they were not meant to be used and in very also again very counterintuitive ways or even about social engineering and using people about in ways that they're not programmed to be used and, and make them behave in unexpected ways. It's uh, it's really hard. And then, you know, security is uh, you're as secure as your weakest uh, as your as your weakest link, let's say. So it's there's a lot of motives out there. It's a tough world out there. So it will only increase the demand, definitely. But now can we increase a little bit the talent pool out there? Honestly, I don't know. I don't know. How to. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to be a security engineer, right? So I, I wouldn't know how to how to upskill somebody into it. One thing I wondered about security engineers, because I've read like books like the Phoenix Project and things like that, um, where there seems to be like a disdain almost. I mean, and I know it's quite a simple book in terms of engineering, but there seems to be like a disdain towards like the security or department um, in that book. Does that bring any truth to the organizations you work with? I think there is a disdain, like maybe, I don't know, not security specifically. I don't think so. Um, we're, ver we're, we're very good as well on our side, on the engineering side. We're very good at being at otherizing ourselves at putting ourselves, let's go, you know, let's go to the darkest room and go from there. Or, you know, we're good at creating our own clique as well and at not mingling and, and at, uh, so, so I don't know. I, I don't think, I, I think that that does happen. That dynamic exists, tech versus non-tech. And actually a lot of, a, a lot of part of my job is actually to show everyone, no, this is one company. There's no tech that there's departments, but there's like, but it's the company, there's the department, and there's the company, it's us, like we're all a team, we're all pushing the same direction. But that happens a lot. But in general, I don't see it with insecurity. No, I actually, I, personally, I, I've always been, again, such a fan and nerded out about hacking and security vulnerabilities and all of those things. So I just, I have a lot of admiration for it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is scary, <laughs> the level of some of them, <laughs> for sure. Um, one thing I wanted to move on to, um, what did I want to move on to? Because to be honest, you're answering a lot of these uh, these questions that we, we, had, we had planned anyway. Um, one thing that's so important, whether it be freelancing, whether it be hiring a permanent member of staff, is this retention of software engineers. And from working in the Berlin space for the last three, three to four years, I have noticed that there's a lot of like, one of the reasons for moving is just simply, oh, I've been in the job two years. I've been in the job a year and a half. How do, how do you measure and improve this sort of retention rate for, for software in, in an organization, you know? Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's a good question. That I, I wouldn't claim that I would know the answer to, to be honest. Um, the specifically the way you the way you framed it i have i have seen that uh, a lot like the expectation or the belief in some engineers especially younger that those two years that went by were so intense you learned, you learned so much you're ready to move on and i understand the incentive to do that uh but i think but it's not clear to me that long term you are truly getting as much as you could from an experience. At the same time, you know what? It is, we're not in the age anymore where people would spend their lives in one, working for one company that's gone. I think we also need to be a lot, we can, we can all benefit from being a little bit more transactional about the topic, but then also being a little bit more professional about the topic. So it feels like, in in some way to me it's normal that somebody wants to go after two years maybe maybe this didn't work out for them and i i'm okay with that you know when people feel that if that the organization that i'm trying to build the goals that i'm saying or the goals that i'm setting or the things that i'm saying they don't resonate with everyone and i'm okay with people not wanting to be part of it and deciding to move on um but but I've also felt that it, it is very hard for a lot of people in the industry to deal with it. 
sometimes you know people are leaving out of uh, their rage quitting their jobs right and maybe for the wrong reasons maybe for the right reasons but there is value in sticking around five years in sticking around eight years because you can see things that happen in the long term that are very hard to see in the in the in the, those two years that you were there it feels like a long time when you're when you're young two years but it's actually not that long it goes by really fast so <clears throat> i've 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 always but but again so i think that's up to each uh, each person to figure out how long do they want to stay with their current em employee uh, employer um but and yeah and and i think we can be more transactional about it but at the same time so what to do to prevent that i like to talk about the long term i like i i really like to talk often about it for people to think about this is what we're doing today but look in six months this and then in six in three years it's going to be like that that's part of the job but that that helps keep people around that helps people go through the tough times um because it's it's a marathon it's not a sprint it's it's a huge marathon it's a very long marathon if you're talking about scale-ups and the end is an ipo or an exit of some sort building a company takes time takes a lot of blood sweat and tears and and you need to also be there for the right reasons um we're also in a point where it's i think it's tough for people nowadays to to vent about overall their frustrations we have an econ the last year was tense before that we it was maybe less tense but also quite tense with the with the pandemic and we have our jobs and very little more right we have some family time etc but we don't so but there's only so much that your employer your manager your cto can fix. Um, sometimes we are frustrated with good reasons for a company. We don't want to work with that anymore. But sometimes I've also seen people, you know, rage quitting their jobs, and then maybe some years later, looking back and saying, "Well, that that was actually a, a good job." You know, comparing to other things. You also, you know, when you're young, the, the grass is always greener on the other side. But actually, so it's good again going back to having those that those reference points, understanding really how it is in other companies what are actually we doing here for the long term because you know if you're young and you're out there you should be working for the right things you should be working for the long term you should be working for some for a company that is trying to do something about something to have a mission that a good mission in the world you shouldn't be just working for the man so if you're working for the man good rage quit awesome <laughs> but then you know also it's important i think it i think it's really important to then convey what's the long term vision here how does that change the world and i think that that's the 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 way that you try it, that's what you can control of that equation it's to tell people how they're changing the world and keep reminding them of that and then if they feel that okay that's not how i change the world i want to change the world this other way then okay fine don't go and do that because that's your journey so if you're doing that that's as much as you can do yeah and then people also are free to work to whoever with whoever they want yeah i mean that's a, a great insights in the summary um one you obviously went and, and and stayed at hellofresh for eight years what was some of the maybe i can give you your time to big up hellofresh here but what are some of the strong company values that kept you there for so long ah uh, um and and an objective look at the world and a, and really a a, 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 a way to a, a scientific method as well or an attempt to remain humble an attempt to remain focused on objective facts to make decisions not be afraid of you know make undo a decision that was not the right decision learning from the mistakes being putting your ego aside in order to do that. That was the culture that the founders had set up, uh, Dominic and Thomas, and and something that really kept me um, for a long time there, and that I still, you know, still value a lot, and that I try to bring with me all the time, is HelloFresh's core values and the way that they, they are and were practiced since the beginning there, always very, you know, very, very data-driven, very objective, and it has allowed for, for yeah for a lot of great things so and that way is a very I've, I've always found it to be a very fair way to to run a business 
where ultimately it's not about who says what, it's about what's the data that you have to back up, what's the case that you're making it, and how, um, how consistent are you being, you know, rationally, how, how much does your argument add up? So I was very clumsy when I started working at HelloFresh with my argumentation and with making a case for something. Why should we prioritize something? Why is this the most important thing that we should be doing right now versus a lot of competing priorities and just the method that Dominic and Thomas have put into into building a company and that have and have truly baked it into the culture has been has been really a, to me a life lesson and and you know invaluable. Amazing and um, I mean now maybe a chance to big up your your new company. I don't think we've mentioned the name of yet either. Um, what are some of the core values and, and to why you've jo you joined this new company? So yeah, so I've joined Tier Mobility um very recently and still in in onboarding process um and i'm extremely excited about it it's uh, an amazing product it's trying to change the world in an impressive way and in a way that really resonates with me as a father of two daughters but the, the when i heard that they were looking for a cto and this was really it happened really fast and it was last minute on on all parties um it was, I, I was up for it immediately when I saw that email, uh, because I know the, because I know the company, it's, it's here in Berlin where I live and where I've worked, um, for the last 10 years. So I've, and, and I find the idea extraordinary. I think that it's a long-term thing. I, I started skeptical and, you know, sharing the dissatisfaction of a lot of citizens around the scooters, not the bikes necessarily, but the scooters and how. You know, some of our citizens uh, also leave them parked. But to me, it's a long term play and it's really about, OK, yes, it is. It is the way it is right now. But let's imagine a little bit when, you know, let's imagine cities without cars. Right. And but let's be bold about imagining that. So, OK, people still need to get around. People still need to get around in a sustainable way. How do they do that? And, you know, not saying that it's just the scooters or just the bikes, but the mobility, the, how, allowing people to, because a city without cars maybe will even bring other chances, right? Other options of how you can move people around and how people can can move. So that has been that has been a great, great thing. And the, the values that they have have also been quite, quite inspiring, inspiring. Um, uh, it's a it's a very different company here. Lawrence and, and Matthias, uh, who I've who I've met, have um, and who I've been working with, have um, have built a, a very. It's it's a company that cares to the core about its mission, and that it's extremely sophisticated on how it operates. And I do want to say this because it is it is very impressive to have found a company at their stage of growth how fast they grew and how young they are as a company as well that is operating in the way that I see. And it's, you know, after a few weeks of onboarding, you can see a little bit more and and I remain impressed with with what I've seen. So so it's a company that also and that is also ambitious, values a lot, the delivering a great, a great experience. Um, super high uh, uh, quality standards um and but the, and that is also very very human uh, on on how on how it thinks about the business and the mission in the world so i really liked really really i'm really enjoying it and i'm um really looking forward for the years um at tier and uh, and and being part of that journey amazing um just a, just a final question on on this section and in terms of th that sort of retention rate and you know the the market etc and and even from your perspective as as a father, do you see any like new trends with this sort of you know Gen Z hires and like the new generation coming through? Like how do you how do you accommodate this? I don't know if you're gonna get me to okay. <laughs> I don't want to I don't want to sound like the old man. Okay, so that's the first thing. I hope I won't. 
So it's not, I don't have, I don't think that there's a generational thing. That's, there's always a generational thing, right? And you're either going, oh, these old people, or you're going, oh, these young people today, right? So it, you're either in one side or the other of it. There is a generational mode. There will always be, will be. Young people are fine. They're going to rock it. They're going to rock it in their own way. But, you know, like other generations, they will thrive. However, there is, I think, a different preparation. And also, of course, this this has a lot to do with privilege and this has a lot to do with where you come from exactly and how exactly have you grown up. But it may be that today for a lot of people starting in their work in the workforce, it is not clear to me that they have the same understanding of what a workplace is like or what is what is, what what is a good standard of work ethics or what are the expectations on work ethics when you start your job? So I think that the professional life, in my experience, I was very close to the professional life of both of my parents. I would spend time in my father's office or the company that he worked with. My mom was a teacher. She would, uh, you know, uh, uh, correct tests at home, talk a lot about the job anyway. I was I I would go to their workplaces. I would I would go to meetings sometimes. I remember being a kid and being in meetings with my father because you know they didn't have anyone to take care of me. So that's some as that would that would be occasions. And my father also has had and both my parents have always had a very high work ethics. They worked a lot. They spent a lot of effort into working, and we've always valued a lot work at home. And and that has no and i feel that over time that may may not be the case for a lot of people and may not be the case for a lot of people today and what i find today is that especially more junior people have a lot of the times and this is not i wouldn't say that this is even a general rule but on occasion i do find let's say frequently <laughs> that yeah, some people have the wrong expectations as to what a workplace is or even what are the pro problems that your employer should be solving uh, or that even wants to solve or is interested in solving. So, and I think that that's now our job also to, to, to solve. Either we decide that we want to go with, with a more senior talent, people that are already, you know, have proven marks that have delivered great work etc or if you do want to hire junior talent then it is your job to finish their training years because maybe maybe that in the past it was a given that people would come in they need they know it's a, a, they need to be there on time they need to ask for holidays or whatever that bosses are really strict but that's not really the, the stereotype anymore um, especially with startups we also give a lot of perks People have heard about these perks. The young generations have heard about perks in the office. They don't necessarily hear about maybe long nights working, uh, working until midnight or whatever. So I think that you just have to deal with that as a as a boss and as a as a leader. You have to set the right expectations. You have to explain to people. You have to, when needed, help them become fully formed adults. Or you can decide to not hire. Uh, people that need that type of effort and not put in the effort of building, breathing new talent or even not having the value of having the new generations also in your workforce and getting their feedback about your product, right? So you are missing out on a lot as well uh, by not putting in that effort. You're not building the leaders of tomorrow. You're not thinking long term, um, all of those things. So if there's value that you that you have out of hiring, people that are young, and there's a lot of value in hiring people that are young, you need to create an environment where they can thrive. And that means sometimes just, you know, explaining to them that there are some, maybe more in a more clear way than you were expecting you had to explain some of the rules of your workplace, the workplace that you're running. And that's just something you have to do. That's how I see it. Amazing. You navigated that question very well. <laughs> um, that, that, I mean, that's all I, I, I had to ask in terms of very specific tech. And I, I think we can maybe go on to a very quick fun, fun section in terms of uh, some quick fire um, okay. questions. Um, Nuno, you already mentioned sort of Accelerate and I think modern software engineering. Are there like 
would there be a top five or a top three or even a you know a bible uh for you in terms of book recommendations for, for building tech knowledge uh i would say those two and now because of tier of course i do have a new I, I'm not that big on hardware and firmware development, so I started reading this book that was recommended to me, Product Realization. I've, I've, I've been finding it very helpful um, and very interesting, so maybe I'd recommend that one. And then I did enjoy a lot a book called Exponential. I think it's very helpful to understand in a much more bigger picture kind of thing how, you know, the, the impact of technology, what actually is hyper growth? Why does it happen? How can it happen? How can you enable it? So it's very, I found it very interesting. So that's that's four books already. By Azim Azar. Azim Azar, exactly, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> no worries. How do you prioritize and manage your time as a tech leader? So more specifically, do you have like a morning routine that maximizes productivity? <laughs> I do have a morning routine that I hold very dear and that I enjoy a lot. Um, I wake up, I put breakfast in on the table for my kids. I prepare breakfast for my wife and bring it to her in bed. And then I go and take my kids to, I get dressed, go and, my, my, go and take my kids uh, to school. So, and then hopefully I go swim. And that's how I try to start most of my days as much as possible. Um, and sometimes I can't. But then when I get to the office, like every day is a new day and every day has its own priorities. I have no, not necessarily fixed schedule. There are, of course, some fixed meetings that always land on certain places of the week, but that tends to change over time. And those tend to be set by others. Usually I set meetings. Uh, I, I do set the recurring meeting with certain people that are important in my team, uh, but um, I try not to have those, uh, not to have many of those or to not have many of those for for a long time and to change it around a little bit. But yeah, every day is a, is a new is a new backlog, I would say. Interesting. And um, just mentioning family there as well. What is your best advice for someone who is in the position of a CTO, which has obviously got so much weight on their shoulders, it can be quite a lonely job as well being the you know the only person at that position or level what's the best advice on balancing a role like this in leadership and your family i cannot give that uh, the advice of marrying my wife um but she has been um, invaluable to me like without her uh, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have uh, done any things uh, that I've done at HelloFresh and beyond uh, because she has been um, the pillar um, at home. So at home, it's everything is very easy. I just I just, you know, she sets the priorities. She sets the backlog there and she holds everything together. So, you know, my job there is to, you know, find the time to be with to, to be with the girls, to be with her and to to participate, to do my, my part. Um, but, um, but yeah, so that's, I think that's really important. And uh, I, I, I don't know, and I know some high performing couples, uh, which both where both of them work and it's, I don't know how they do it uh, and with kids. So uh, my wife took, took one for the team and decided to to not focus on her career. She has worked on and off, but it hasn't been a priority for the family. And um, uh, but she has added a, a lot of value in, in many of the ways, one of them by enabling me to to have my career um, and so and be here at this time, having this having this interview, for example, yeah. while she's, uh, she's at home with, at home with the kids sleeping. Amazing. So you have that anchor, right? And yeah. as long as you make her breakfast in the morning, she's happy. <laughs> I, I do. It has been. It's a long time thing. I, I did promise that so that she would accept to marry me. <laughs> That's lovely. That's lovely. Go on the topic of uh, food. What is your? You, I know you said you you have a very big love for Berlin. What's your favorite food to eat in Berlin? In Berlin, uh, that's a new question. I. Um, Oh man, the sushi from Royals and Rice is really good. 
I, I really, or I ordered that in uh, a lot. I would say that one. Yeah, sushi from Royals and Rice. And then favorite drink? Bex. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a German beer? I'm not sure. <laughs> um, I would say favorite drink, no, really favorite drink, uh, gin and tonic, Hendrix uh, with cucumber. Love it. Absolutely love it. One final question, you know. What advice would you give someone who is starting out in the tech industry as a junior software engineer, someone who's sort of navigating this space between these new bootstrap startups and giants of the tech industry that, you know, look like they're on hiring freezes and things. They're not sure where to start, what to learn, what to go after. Do you have any general advice for for, for these sort of people? Be a junior all your life, like forget about getting that promotion. Don't be eager for the promotion. You'll like, it's not a, a, a one year or a two year thing. Like learn as much as you can, whenever you can with whoever you can about engineering. If it doesn't matter the language, you don't have to be a JavaScript or a, or a React or a whatever X engineer. If you want to be a software engineer, just get on with it, start doing it, build it and learn from the senior people, listen to them, try to understand why they do things. They won't always be right. And over time, you'll figure that out. You don't need to take everything that they say, but also, but listen, because it is the experience in this job and the years of experience go a long way. So if you find somebody with a gray hair in your team, there's a good chance that that person has seen a lot and has a lot to teach. So, so listen, don't, don't be too eager to talk uh, uh, and to, to, and for your time to talk, but rather listen and shadow people, ask questions, ask as many questions as you can uh, of, for as, as many people as you can shadow people. If there's a senior engineer firefighting, go and see what he's doing, what he's typing. Don't make a noise, <laughs> don't annoy him, but see what they're doing. That's that's been very valuable to me, and also always. And but that's the the advice: remain remain a junior at heart, remain humble, keep reading things, keep learning things, and buying books to be interested in other perspectives, even if these are things that you know already. That's that's key to be a good to be successful here. It is only when you start being too confident of yourself that bad stuff happens that you start you know you're overconfident you think you're you're good at this and suddenly bam you drop the database in production or whatever uh, you don't want which is something you don't want to do so yeah remain a junior all your life that's that's the best advice i have amazing and really good advice to, to, to end that on um thank you thank you so much mate for for joining me uh it's been a pleasure uh, I've been. This is the longest I've stood up for for a while, and I've enjoyed every every second of it. Uh, it's flew by. Um, so yeah, thank you, thank you so much for for joining me. Thank you for having me, Gus. I'd like you to thank uh, Nuno for joining me. Um, it's been really intriguing hearing about his journey so far and learning about some of his values. Uh, tune in next time for more insights and discussions with engineering leaders. We really hope you enjoyed listening to today's podcast. You can listen on all major streaming platforms. You can find us on LinkedIn at Source Technology and uh, on our website at www.sourcetechnology.com. If you are interested in joining this community, uh, sharing your insights and stories from different business contexts, or just generally being involved, we would love to hear from you. Uh, please reach out to me. We'll book in a call um, and you can join our growing community. We can't wait to share more conversations like this with you so you can take yourself to the next level. Thank you so much for joining and thank you for tuning in. This has been The Tech Lab. I have been Gus, your host, and I look forward to the next episode. Cheers, guys.